Apple reported fourth quarter earnings last week, and since then, the stock is down roughly 5%. Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett are also trimming their Apple position. The stake is down 67.2% from the end of the third quarter last year. Yet, after all that, I've updated Apple's page on Rated A, and the company is still a quality rating of A. So in this video, we're going to go over Apple's full year results and see how they did, the good, the bad, the ugly. I'm also going to cover Warren Buffett's change of mind and selling Apple. And then I'm going to go over my take and why I still think that Apple is a great company to hold for the long term. So first things first, Apple likes to separate its operating segments into geographical regions. The company sales were up slightly in America, up a little bit more in Europe, but most importantly, down 8% in China. And this is on the back of a 2% drop the year before. So why do I say most important? Well, despite China being a smaller region compared to Europe and to America, it's the source of a lot of risk and uncertainty when people look at Apple and how to value it. It's not that hard to think of reasons why. The main one being uh, the political party in charge in China that's very unpredictable. It also likes to interfere in the business world. And the current leader in China has a history of interfering with national tech companies in China like Tencent and Alibaba and has the reputation of being more hardline when it comes to geopolitics. And so this has always been a source of risk uh, for Apple, given that Apple's supply chain is mostly located in China. A lot of Apple components, whether it's screens or batteries or even the final assembly of a lot of devices like the iPhone, is done in China. Not only that, but Chinese consumers are also avid buyers of Apple products. And so what we're seeing here is that people are buying less Apple products in China, probably mostly iPhones. Given that Apple is more of a premium product uh, that could be due to the recession that's currently happening over there in China, then there's also the question of competition. Huawei is a big player over there. Uh, I'm assuming Samsung is as well. And so the Apple dominance in that territory is not as strong as in places like Japan or North America. But actually, I like to see this drop in revenue coming from China. Because as of 2024, China is now only responsible for 17% of Apple's total revenues. And I like that because as the revenue dependency on China goes down over time compared to the total revenues, then so does the risk. So I thought that was the first important point to note on Apple's annual report. Now let's take a more granular look into Apple's uh, services and devices. So the iPhone by far is still the most important part of Apple's business. It contributed more than half of total revenues last year. But what we can see with the iPhone is that sales have really stagnated since 2022. And if you want to be really specific, they're actually down from 205 billion to 201 billion last year. Now, I have a few theories for this. I'm not sure which one is the correct one. The first is that people just haven't had the time uh, that they need to replace the iPhone. Remember, we came off a super boom in 2020, 2021, and 2022, where people were working from home because of the pandemic. And I'm pretty sure that everyone had to replace their laptops and their phones in order to optimize you know, their screen times. And it very well could be that since then, sales have slowed because people just don't need to replace them yet. So if this theory is correct, then we should see an acceleration in growth coming in 2025, 2026, as people, you know, complete that cycle and go back to stores to get new phones and new laptops. The other theory, which is a lot more sinister for Apple, is that the lack of innovation is causing people to not be as interested in iPhones. Just this year, Apple was super excited to present uh, their new innovation called Apple Intelligence. And Apple Intelligence really is just a tool to help you become more creative. So it helps you write or express yourself, get things done effortlessly, find just the right words virtually everywhere you write, summarize an entire lecture in seconds, get the short version of a long group thread, etc., etc. And it also allows you to express yourself better visually. So it can create images for you, it can create videos for you, etc. 
thing is, to me, this is more of a tool than a really innovative breakthrough. And if anything, this brings Apple closer in line to its competitors like the Google Pixel or the Samsung Galaxy that already are more technologically advanced than Apple is. So nothing crazy there. So if anything, I think it's important to keep monitoring this situation here with the iPhone and see how the situation evolves over the coming years. The next thing I want to point out uh, is Apple services revenue. They went up 13% this year compared to 9% last year. And this portion of Apple's revenue, the services, is very high margin. Remember, this is once you have the iPhone and people are using that, then they can pay Apple uh, for the Apple News Plus service or Apple TV Plus. The insurance that Apple offers on any stolen or damaged iPhones is also included in this segment. So this is extremely high margin revenue because the marginal costs are super, super low. But people have been looking at this 13% figure here and saying that this is not deserving of Apple's valuation. Because remember, the story surrounding Apple for the past few years has been that the company is transitioning from a hardware company to a software company. And that means less cyclicality in revenues. It means higher margins more scalability. And so all of these factors have made that Apple's valuation and the multiple on the free cash flow has expanded tremendously over the past 10 years. In 2015, the price of free cash flow was around 15 times. Today, it's closer to 30 or 35. But people are looking at this and saying that 13% is not that quick of revenue growth for services. Now, I disagree with this. I think 13% is very good growth especially considering that the year prior it was 9%, so that we're seeing an acceleration of growth. Also, 13%, that's double digits. That's relatively quick, especially if Apple can keep this up year after year after year. Considering that the iPhone sales were pretty much flat year over year, that means that services is becoming an increasingly important part of Apple's total revenues. So the story of Apple becoming more of a software company is still intact. If we move on to the consolidated financials, we can see this trend here of the products just kind of losing steam since 2022, from 316 to 298 to 294. So once again, my theory is that this is due to the glut that happened in 2022, and that little by little, this trend will stabilize and maybe go back towards growth as people replace their iPhones and their MacBooks. But this is one of those show me moments for Apple. What I think is really good to see for Apple shareholders is the other part of the revenue, which is the services. From 78 to 85 to 96, that's really consistent double-digit growth. And look at the cost of those services. Last year, the revenue for services went up by 11 billion. Well, the cost of those revenues was only up 0.3 billion. So that's what I mean by scalability. And this is why services deserve a much higher multiple. Then we get to the shares outstanding portion of the income statement. And we see that shares have gone from 15.7 billion to 15.3 billion. So that's good. Share count is decreasing, which means that if you own one share of Apple, you now own more of the company compared to last year. And if I have a criticism for Apple and Tim Cook, it's this one. During 2024, the company repurchased 95 billion of common stock. And in May 2024, the company announced a new share repurchase program of up to $110 billion. Now, this is huge. And this is Apple being a super profitable company and deciding to return capital to shareholders via buybacks. And this is where my main problem comes in with the capital allocation at Apple. Share buybacks are a great tax efficient way of returning capital to shareholders, especially when shares are cheap. What do I mean by cheap? I mean that the relative price compared to the free cash flow is lower. And check this out. In 2015, Apple shares were trading at below 10 times the free cash flow of the time. Today, this number is closer to 40. We're at 39, which means that even though Apple is spending a lot more on share buybacks, that money is just not going very far. My personal opinion is that Apple should start prioritizing the dividend more given that the shares are more expensive. This might not be very popular, but that's what I think would be best for Apple shareholders. 
because the dividend is really not growing all that quickly. Look at that, 4% in the past three years, 5% CAGR in the past five years. That's very similar to the very mature, boring, blue chip dividend stocks. So actually, in all honesty, I think the fact that Apple is repurchasing shares at this valuation introduces valuation risk. Obviously, it would be better if Apple held on to the cash and then the shares dropped and they'd be able you know, to buy back their own shares at that point. But you never know when the shares are going to drop uh, and people would probably not be happy if Apple kept all this cash on their balance sheet. So pros and cons. I think this is what happens when you have a company that's just gushing so much cash that they don't know what to do with it. If we look at the free cash flow, which is, in my opinion, the most important metric to track for any company when you're going to invest in it, it was actually a record year for Apple. $6.33 per share, which is one cent more than what they did in 2022. So when I look at this chart, the free cash flow per share, it doesn't seem too alarming to me if I take the long-term view. No company is gonna grow at double digit percent forever. What is more important is the long-term trends. And if a company has one or two or three years of slowing revenue growth, if the market doesn't take that well, well, that might be an opportunity for you to get in at that point. The next piece of big news that I want to cover is Warren Buffett selling Apple shares in Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. Warren Buffett has been cutting down his Apple position for the past few quarters in a row, but this time felt different. He sold approximately 25% of his entire position last quarter. And as things currently stand, Berkshire Hathaway now has $325 billion on its balance sheet. Now, obviously, he wants to stay as neutral as possible, and he hinted that the selling was for tax reasons because he speculates that the tax on capital gains could be raised in the future by a U.S. government wanting to plug a climbing fiscal deficit. So that would make sense with the coming election. You never know what's going to happen. And he's selling his Apple stake because he has a huge capital gains uh, on them. And if he ever tries to sell those shares, he's going to be maybe taxed very heftily. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but people are speculating that his reasons are very different. Some people are saying that Warren Buffett is just, you know, getting old and he's preparing for the future of the company that will be without him. After all, maybe he just wants to leave Ted and Todd with a clean slate and clear Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio from any picks that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have done in the past, no matter how successful they've been. That's definitely one possibility. Other people, and this is definitely the louder part of the crowd, are saying that Berkshire is preparing for a market crash. After all, Warren Buffett has had the skill and the talent to recognize bubbles and overvalued markets in the past. He did really well in the 2008 financial crisis, of course. Before the stock market crash, he was hoarding a lot of cash. And then when things went south, he came in with a huge amount of cash and bought out so many different companies. And that worked out really well for him. So people are thinking maybe he's doing the same thing this time. What I think is that we need to remember the common saying in investing, that is people sell for many reasons, but they buy for only one, and that is to make money. So at the end of the day, who knows why Warren Buffett sold his stake in Apple? But my question is, does it matter? The only thing that's important is to figure out if Apple is still a high quality company. If the fundamentals change in Apple, then maybe if you're holding Apple shares, it's worth it to mimic what Warren Buffett is doing and to get rid of some of them. After all, Warren Buffett is an excellent investor. He's value and quality oriented. He said it himself that he likes to buy quality companies at a fair price. And so if his reason of selling is that Apple is just becoming less of a good company, and it's up to Apple shareholders on their end to do their own analysis and research and figure out uh, if they agree or disagree with Warren Buffett. If you're still watching at this point of the video, thank you very much for being here. Make sure you support the channel by leaving a like uh, on this video and subscribe if you think that this content is interesting and you want to see more of it in the future. Okay, so now that we've established that the Warren Buffett headline is pretty much fugazi for any long-term investor, what do I think about Apple's quality? 
Here we have the answer on the screen. The company still has a rating of A, although that's on the lower range. And this year we've had some changes in component scores. So the mode score went from a four to a five and the profitability went the other direction from a five to a four. I'm gonna say a quick word about each of those components now. So regarding the moat, the moat is at a maximum value of five. And that's simply because Apple's main competitive advantage is still the ecosystem, the walled garden. And that walled garden is alive and well. We can see that despite Apple's lack of revolutionary innovation, people are still sticking to their Apple products. Please let me know in the comments section below if your experience is different, but most people, once they start using the iPhone and the Mac and leaving their photos and all their data on the Apple ecosystem, then that Apple ID is so important and they rarely switch to a different system. If you use Apple for your personal life, it's likely to stay this way. Apple's customer loyalty rate ranges between 85 to 90%, which is extremely high. And some market research firms like Consumer Intelligence Research Partners and Statista report that people switching from Android to iPhone happens slightly more often than the reverse. So people are sticking with iPhone, people are not switching out of the Apple ecosystem. Once again, the moat is alive and well. Next, we have profitability. So like I said, this went down from a five to a four, and we've already covered this. Apple sales are stagnating. In order for this score to go back up, I would like to see the iPhone sales creeping back up in the coming years. Now for the safety profile, the main thing that comes to mind is all the anti-competitive pressure that Apple has been put through by the Department of Justice and the European Union. The good news for Apple is that they won their legal battle against Epic Games earlier in 2024. Remember that Epic Games was pretty much suing Apple and the App Store for being a monopoly. Every transaction that happened within Epic Games' own store, Apple was still taking a 30% commission on those transactions. Well, Apple won that case, but now the Department of Justice is coming to Apple once again and suing them all over again. Like I've written here, uh, the accusations specifically target Apple's restrictions on super apps that offer broad functionalities, limitations on cross-platform services like messaging between iPhones and Android devices. So, you know, the green text versus the blue text and blocking of cloud streaming apps that could reduce consumer dependence of expensive hardware. So basically, once again, the DOJ is coming in and telling Apple how not to run its business and saying that it's anti-competitive. And once again, if Apple loses this, then it would be really bad for Apple's moat. But the likelihood of that happening, in my opinion, is fairly low, especially since Apple won the previous case against Epic Games. The other thing is that this case is probably going to, you know, take a long time to resolve itself. And so we'll see how things develop in the coming years, but there won't be a resolution to this case uh, for probably quite some time. So Apple is still a high quality company uh, according to our rated A standards. The main problem with this stock is the valuation, 35 free cash flow multiple. So what this means, when you have a high quality company trading for a high multiple, if you own shares of Apple today, just hold on to them. High quality companies can stay expensive for a very long time and meanwhile grow their earnings year after year after year. So if you're a long term buy and hold investor and you manage to get into Apple at a fair price, just hold on to your shares right now. If you're still not currently an Apple shareholder, that's where I would say be careful with the valuation. Because if Apple sales continue to slow down, dare I say go even lower than their current levels, well, we could see the valuation easily drop from 35 to a 20, and that's pretty much minus 40% on the stock price. So, you know, I like to do a quick valuation exercise. This is rated a total shareholder return calculator, which calculates based on your assumptions, what kind of return you could expect uh, from Apple shares moving forward for the next five years. So this calculation is based on today's price, today's revenues, I've estimated around 3% of revenue growth for the next five years, which is quite conservative. Margin is in line with last year's. For the shares outstanding, I'm still assuming that Apple is going to direct most of its free cash flow to buying back shares. Terminal multiple is uh, quite conservative as well, 25 compared to today's 35. 
Dividend growth of 4%, quite conservative too, and 100% of dividends reinvested. We get to minus 2% per year for the next five years. So not the best deal. Now, once again, I've lowballed my assumptions here. But the thing is, even if I double Apple's revenue growth rate from three to six, and I increase the terminal multiple from 25 to 30, the total shareholder return per year for the next five years is still 4.4%. So much less than the market average of 10%. So there you have it. I hope you found the information in this video useful. Remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.